Perfect. All right. I am ready. Let me just put it up here. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and let everyone in. Hey, everyone. Thank you for logging on. Thank you for joining us for our breakout session. Just give a few more minutes to let people get in and then we'll go ahead and start. I think this is the best profile picture I've, I've ever seen. Miss Audrey, I love yours with the chocolate. That's so cool. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Myra, yours almost looks like glasses. It is Harry Potter glasses. Woohoo. You're in the right breakout session. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you. All right. So it looks like we've got people logged on now. Very good. This is your last, this is the one after lunch. So thank you guys for joining us. Hope you had a great lunch. Um, and uh, we will go ahead and um, talk about vision here. So. Uh, title of this breakout session is How Virtual Learning is Affecting Your Eyes. So I'm sure you are all dying to know, uh, you know, uh, what's going on. You know, everybody's been on screen time so much more. And uh, I get asked this question nearly, you know, several times a day from parents just wanting to know, you know, what they can do to protect their kids' eyesight now that they're doing so much virtual learning. I know that iLead has always been kind of virtual. Um, but I, I know that just as a society in general, we're all using our screens more. Um, this is not just for learners. This is actually for you as well as the leads and as the administrators. You guys, I'm sure, are um, having increased screen time as well. And so this, admits, uh, this um, uh, applies to everybody. So uh, my name is Dr. Lamb. Uh, I am an optometrist. I work with iLead. I help with the special education services. If a learner needs vision therapy or needs a visual assessment, um, that's usually um, where I get to be involved with their learning team. So I really, really love working with the schools. I love working with the administrators that you guys have at iLead. Just a fantastic organization. And so um, tell you a little bit about me. Um, I am an optometrist, but I also do vision therapy. And vision therapy, in my mind, is really a great blend of medicine and education. And so it's, it's such a cool blend of the two fields that we get to be involved with vision skills that affect um, learners and their academic success. So today's lecture, I want to answer three questions for you. The first question is, how do eyes work differently when learning on screens versus in the classroom? So our environments are very much different now that we're doing virtual learning. And so um, I wanna talk a little bit more about it from the scientific side. Um, after that, we're gonna talk about question number two, will increased screen time permanently harm my eyes? I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the effects that, are, that all this virtual learning and increased screen time is actually having um, on our vision system. And the last question, which is why you are all here today, is what can I do to help protect my eyes? So the take home message, it wouldn't be very helpful if I didn't give you anything to take home, is things that you can do to help protect you and your learner's eyes um, from so much screen time. Let me tell you a little bit about me. So this is my office here. Um, in this picture on the left, this is my team. Uh, we are an optometry office. Uh, we just moved. So funny story is that we um, were established back in 2015. My partner is that gentleman in the left with the black tie on. And what happened was uh, we decided to move the office. So we just moved to a brand new space. Uh, it was so exciting. We closed down the office for like two weeks to move all the equipment over. We just reopened and then COVID hit and we had to shut down for two months. So we're like, oh man, what a crazy year. But uh, we are, you know, we are making it. We're doing great. Um, the office is back open. Everybody's really, really happy to be back. Um, I want to introduce you to my family. So this is my family. This is my husband and my two girls. Um, I am married to an educator. So my husband is a math teacher at Garner Grove High School, teaches algebra and trigonomics there. 
and, and statistics, and uh, he loves it. He loves being an educator. Um, I have two daughters. One's name is Emily. She's four and a half. And my other daughter's name is Allie. She's two and a half. So I am also a parent like many of you and um, enjoy doing the fun work-life mom balance. So it's great. This is our practice. So welcome to Insight Vision Center. I am a real doctor. I do actually work in an office. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what our office looks like and our cool exam room is supposed to look like a tree house. So that's really fun. Uh, we're in Costa Mesa, California in Orange County area. Um, and uh, this is our, our new shiny space. So it's kind of fun. So let's jump into question number one. Question number one, how do eyes work differently when learning on screens versus in the classroom? All right, so let's talk about working distance. First of all, we are at the screens, we are at what we call intermediate vision, which means if you stretch your arms out and wiggle your fingers at the tip of your fingers, that's gonna be what we call intermediate range, right? So our eyes are postured at a lot closer distance now that we're doing virtual learning versus distance learning. If you think about a traditional classroom um, setting where you have a room, you have um, a, you know, a long room, hopefully, you know, and you have a teacher in the front or you have desks or you have you know, little groups of desks where students would collaborate and work together. That's very much a, co a, a more of a distance type of environment. Granted, it's within a room, but you know, hopefully the kids are going outside, they're playing in, you know, uh, out, out um, you know, during break time or recess time. And so um, you have a lot more dynamic uh, environment that the eyes are having to adjust to versus being seated, you know, at a desk in front of a screen that is only about 50 centimeters away. You know, so it's definitely a very different working distance for the eyes. Um, and with that comes a lot of change in posture and change in the amount of focus that the eyes have to do. We're gonna talk about here, there in some sense, virtual learning has created a less visually distracting environment. So for some of the kids, such as like those with, you know, ADHD, maybe in a sense, it's helped them to focus a little bit better because it's taken away a lot of the distractions that might have been distracting in their environment. Um, some, uh, some kids respond really well to the screen. The screen's very engaging. And so it helps them to sit and to be able to focus and keep track of one thing at a time. Um, on the other hand, though, there is a lot of less visual variation in their environment. So again, you're looking at one target only at a certain distance away versus being in a classroom environment where you just have a lot of stimulation, your eyes looking near, looking far, they're looking at your classmate, they're looking at the, at the teacher or at the coach, you know, and it's just a lot of variation of the eye movements and where your eyes would be focusing throughout the day. Also, one thing to keep in mind is tracking skills. So tracking is the movement of our eyes when we read. Um, if you were to grab a partner and watch their eyes when they read, you would notice their eyes move from a left to right fashion and a typewriter sort of movement. So it should be like tick, 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 ding, and then they go to the next um, beginning of the next line down. And so that is the movement of our eyes. And in optometry terms, we call it a saccade, which is a quick eye movement. However, um, a tracking skills are rather different if you're on a screen versus if you're reading on print, right? So a screen, you're not only reading left to right, but you're also scrolling, right? That can be very different um, versus on print, you know, you're reading up and down throughout the page, having to keep your place. We work a lot with students that have trouble keeping their place when they read. So working on improving the accuracy of their eye movements to be able to um, track or, or keep their place better. You know, so um, granted, I, I've heard that reading on screens for some students is easier. They feel like they can engage with the text better. They can change, you know, the, the contrast, the font size, they can blow it up. So I actually think that that's been helpful for some learners. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I do think that, you know, scrolling and trying to keep your place when you're in a digital book versus a print book is also very different. Let's talk about sustained convergence versus virgence flexibility. So if you are like this gal here on the left side where she's having to stare at a computer screen, I drew some arrows just to show you um, that the, our eyes, when we read something, our eyes have to come together to the same position in space. We call that at near convergence, which means both eyes have to turn slightly inward in order to see the text that we're looking at. That's how we can avoid seeing double vision. Um, I'm sure you can all relate to this gal where there's times where you just wanna take off your glasses and just like, oh, like massage up and around your eyebrows and around your temples. 
um, that can come and, and we can get that strain from having such a, a, um, a long period of sustained convergence for our eyes, our eyes having to be in the same posture for such a prolonged period of time. Um, versus virgin flexibility, you know, we are, if we are again in a dynamic environment where we're moving around a classroom or, you know, within a group setting, working with other peers, right, um, we are looking at a whole lot of different uh, targets at different distances. Some targets may be far away, some targets may be up close, and every time our eye has to look at a different distance, our eye changes their posture. So it's a lot more variability and a lot more flexibility required to move about um, a dynamic environment versus sitting in front of something that's more static like a screen. Now let's talk about the eye movements when we're doing things like surfing the web. Um, sometimes I like to say that our eye movements when we're surfing the web, it's kind of like they're like ADD, you know? Um, they say it's like we stay on something on like a website or um, an article that we see on the internet for like six seconds. And within those first six seconds, we decide if we would like to commit and read the rest of the article or if we're done and we're just going to move to the next page. Right, so a lot of eye movements when you're looking on the computer is quick scanning. A lot of rapid eye movements, looking, you know, searching around the page. Also, you know, one thing that we don't think about is like there's tons of like ads that pop up. You know, Google's gotten really smart. They've like put all these ads on the side of your web. So you know, you're constantly kind of trying to filter those out while you're scrolling through a web page, while you're, you know, using that little dial on your mouse to scroll the page down. A lot of quick scanning going on when we're using screen time and have having to be able to track on that screen uh, versus another, you know, a different situation where if we were in a more traditional classroom setting, we might be sitting down and being working on a, um, a written assignment, you know, for a prolonged period of time. And that's like a lot more concentrated focus that's required for our eyes versus kind of this dynamic environment that's on the screen where we're, you know, searching through and having to click through a lot of things, click a lot of buttons, um, definitely very different types of eye movements there. So that leads us into question number two. Will increased screen time permanently harm my eyes? And again, this is applicable to you um, as the leads and as the administrators, um, as well as applicable to your learners, you know? And so this is the question I get all the time from parents saying, is all the screen time gonna harm their eyes? You know, is there anything I need to be looking out for? So let's talk about something that, um, that has been really popular, I think, kind of in the media and, and, and people are wondering a lot about this, which is blue light, right? So what is blue light and what does it do to affect the eye? So here's your color spectrum of light. It light white light can actually be broken down into a rainbow. You might have seen that. If you put white light through a prism, you can see it split into all the different colors of light. Um, blue wavelengths of light is what we consider like more shorter wavelengths. And they're saying that blue light can penetrate through the eye and can reach all the way to the back of the eye in the structure that we call here the macula, right? So the macula, if you think about, uh, many of you have heard of what's called the retina, right? Retina is the structure that's in the back of the eye that captures light and turns it into information. The macula is the very center portion of your retina. So if you were to look at somebody's face, you would notice their face is a lot clearer than the background behind them. The, um, when you look directly at someone's face, it's your macula or the center part of your eye that's looking right at their face. It's our most detailed, um, it's our most detailed, uh, uh, like part of our retina that gives us our most detailed vision is what I'm trying to say. Um, maybe some of you have heard of rods and cones. Those are called photoreceptors. The highest concentration amount of receptors are in the center spot called a macula. So blue light, when it comes in, they say it can penetrate, and they don't have uh, too many long-term studies on this yet because blue light and screen use is rather new, um, but they do know that it does reach all the way back to the macula, and they're afraid of it having long-term effect on that macula. Um, some of you maybe have a loved one in your family that suffers from macular degeneration, right? Macular degeneration is like this part, that macula structure is breaking down or one um, one optometrist told me it's kind of like the eye is rusting, right? It's like that part of the integrity of that structure is not as good anymore. And when that happens, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see like this big blur spot right in the center of your vision, right? When you're trying to look at something, there's this blur spot that's always right in the middle, like you can't ever uh, wipe it away. 
So they're saying with blue light, like they don't want to damage that part of your vision because that's one of the most important parts um, or structures of the eye. Um, other things you've been hearing about blue light is it affects your melatonin levels. So melatonin is the hormone that is responsible for helping us to fall asleep, right? And so it is true that using a lot of blue light, especially before you go to sleep, can mess up your circadian rhythms. It can affect your sleep cycle. Right now, this diagram, this is kind of a funny one, but I thought it was like really dramatic. Like, oh my goodness, it can affect your memory. It's harder to learn. You've got neurotoxins. You're going to get overweight. You can, can lead to cancer. You're like, oh my goodness, you know, it's like so dramatic. But really, I think the take home message of this is, um, you know, the all that exposure to blue light can have effect on your sleep cycle. And as you as educators know, sleep is so important for learning, you know, um, having good sleep habits. Um, very, very important for our learners. And so um, not a good idea to be on screen time, even for yourself, to be on screen time at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, um, because it's, it's harder to fall asleep and it will prevent you from getting a good night's rest. The next thing I want to talk about is myopia, which is nearsightedness. So if any of you wear glasses and the glasses that you wear are helping you to see clearly in the distance, if you take off your glasses, up close is clearer, but far away is really blurry, you are nearsighted. So nearsighted, the official term is called myopia. And I have something cool to teach you. Did you know that in myopia, the reason that causes myopia is that this eyeball is stretching longer. Your eyeball is actually elongating. So here's a quick physics lesson. Um, when light comes into the eye, light converges or it, it bends and it should end straight in the back of the eye, right? And that's how you can get a clear image. Now, if you have myopia or nearsightedness, when light comes into the eye, it stops short. And because it doesn't reach all the way to the back of the eye, it creates a blurry image, right? And so it, the higher your prescription is and the more nearsightedness you have, the longer your eyeball is stretching. That's actually very, very dangerous because the longer the eyeball stretches, the higher chance you have of getting um, more serious um, medical conditions in the eye later on. And so a healthier eyeball is one that is actually shorter. And so that's why we're very passionate um, about trying to decrease the amount of nearsightedness or trying to prevent it from getting worse, which we will talk about coming up in the presentation. You can look down at this picture and just to get a simulation of what myopia is, if you have a small amount of myopia, it's not too blurry. Moderate amount, it's getting a little bit blurrier, but a high amount of myopia, you can see that you can see maybe the outline or the form of what you're trying to look at, but you can't see any detail. You definitely can't see the details of their face. So the more myopic or more nearsighted you are, the more blurry things are far away. The scary thing about nearsightedness is it's on the rise. It's crazy. Do you know that in the 1990s, only 20% of kids were nearsighted? And now in the 2010s, 40% of kids are nearsighted. It's nearly doubled, right? And um, why do they think this has happened, right? They think it's happened because of these three things, increased screen time, nearsighted parents, and less time spent outdoors, right? So for screen time, did you know that, oops, sorry. Did you know that school-age children who spend seven plus hours or more right, have tripled their risk for nearsightedness, right? If you have a if you have one parent that wears glasses, 25% chance that the child will be nearsighted. If two parents wear glasses, 50% chance. So um, it's crazy. There is definitely a genetic component to nearsightedness. So if both parents wear glasses, there's a high chance that both of the kids will, that all the kids will wear glasses. Um, one in four parents nowadays have a child that has nearsightedness. So um, that's about 14 million kids in the US. It's a crazy amount. And we think by 2050, about 50% of the world's population will be myopic. So huge, huge trend in nearsightedness that we're seeing, especially after this pandemic and we've all been indoors and kids have been on screen time more. Um, us as eye doctors totally expect to see shifts in prescriptions um, and uh, more kids coming in with vision problems, you know, because it, it is environmental, you know, it is partially due to what we're doing uh, throughout the day and what we're using our eyes for. All right, so sorry to bring in a gross eye picture, but I am an eye doctor and I just need to share with you what I see on my side of the microscope. So here is a picture of dry eye. Some of you may suffer from dry eye. Dry eye is a chronic condition. It is very prevalent. It can even occur in kids. 
right? But pretty much when we are on screen times, we don't realize this, but we're blinking a whole lot less. We have a decreased blink rate when we're on screen time because we're concentrating and we're staring and we're, you know, reading, you know, uh, uh, whatever website we're looking at or whatever assignment we're working on. And it's almost like subconsciously we're forgetting to blink as often. So if at the end of the day, if you have redness in your eyes or your learner is having complaining of some redness um, in their eyes, that could be an indication of dry eye. Right. And um, you can see here in this image right here, the eyes like a little bit pink, just like a little bit, um, you know, just not happy. Right. And uh, there are two areas in our body that should always remain wet. You know, one's like inside of our mouth and the other one's like our eyes, like our eyes always must stay hydrated. Right. It's one of the tissues that need to be hydrated. It can never dry out. Um, I want to show you something scary here. So here on this right side, we can put an eye drop in the eye. It's very harmless, but it's called sodium fluorescein. It's just like a stain or like a dye, and it will highlight any areas um, un of, uh, of unevenness or areas of damage on the surface of the eye. So this is what I would see on my side of the microscope. And this is truly, I've seen patients that look like this, where you can see all these little green dots right here, and those are dry spots. This person is extremely suffering from um, very severe dry eye. They are probably having burning sensation in their eyes. They probably see very blurry because it's so dry um, and they're having a lot of discomfort and redness. So um, dry eye can be helped. It can be treated. You can do heavy lubrication. There is some medicated eye drops that you can do to treat extreme dry eye, um, but don't suffer with it, you know? And um, we know that with all the increase in, in screen time and visual learning, um, uh, definitely a higher prevalence of dry eyes um, showing, showing up. Okay, sorry, I had to sneeze there, but we're back on. Okay, so early onset of presbyopia. Do you ever feel like your arm is just not long enough? Um, or you were looking at your phone and then suddenly you're like, wait, I have to hold my phone a little bit further out and lean my head back in order to be able to see that when I used to be able to see that last year. Um, that is called presbyopia. So presbyopia is the condition where around in the 40s, um, people start to need reading glasses. Um, and it will happen to 100% of the population. I tell all my patients, I say, look, you're not abnormal. It happens to everybody. Um, it's just a natural change that our body will, will undergo. Um, and what it, it comes, kind of comes down to is the elasticity of the muscle and of the lens inside of our eye. Um, kind of think of it like the autofocus of a camera, right? Our autofocus is really, really strong. Um, but at, over time, it's just that muscle and, and the structure just kind of gets uh, gets tired out. It's like, hey, you've overworked me. You know, I don't want to focus this hard anymore. And so that's when uh, reading glasses uh, can be very, very helpful. Um, and so, you know, used to be between 40 to 45, um, I would see patients start to maybe need a little bit of um, some correction or magnification up close. Um, but now I'm seeing a lot earlier on. I'm seeing early 40s. I'm seeing, you know, late 30s. People come in saying, you know, really, I, I notice it on the computer. My eyes just can't focus as well. Or after a long day of work, I look off the computer screen and my eyes are just blurry. I just can't get my eyes to focus back to normal. Um, and that would be an, an indication that, yes, that we uh, may need to prescribe some kind of near prescription to help the eyes out from focusing so hard. So let's talk about digital vision syndrome. So used to be called computer vision syndrome, um, but now we're not just on the computers. Our eyes are on all kinds of digital devices. I have some people that tell me they're on their phone for two to three hours a day. I think that's crazy, um, but you know, it's, it's not uncommon. I have, you know, we have kids that are playing on iPads. We have all kinds of digital devices that people are using these days. So here are some symptoms of digital vision syndrome. It is actually a kind of a, 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 it's, a true, it's a true thing, right? Um, headaches are very common, especially if you get headaches up around the frontal area, above your eyebrows, um, and also like towards your temple area. Um, we also can have neck and shoulder stiffness. So this is where you feel like you're craning your neck in, you know, like if you're leaning forward, you might feel like, oh, uh, you know, why is my neck and my shoulders feel so tight afterwards? Um, and that can actually cause, uh, be caused from your vision, right? If you're straining or leaning in so hard to try to see uh, what's on the screen, that can actually cause some neck and shoulder stiffness. 
Uh, then we have discomfort with computer use. Again, our eyes just feel tired or feel uncomfortable. Um, and um, dry eyes, we talked about that, caused by decreased blink rate. Um, and light sensitivity, being sensitive to um, light, like the screen looks too bright, or overhead lighting, or even um, just like headlights that come from cars, um, having a lot of light sensitivity. Um, and the last thing I want to describe to you is dizziness. So this is something that we don't always think of that could be vision related. Sometimes you think of dizziness as being like an inner ear imbalance. But do you know that if your eyes have a slight offset, like one can be slightly higher than the other, that, that could actually cause some dizziness or some vertigo um, and, um, and can be you know, fixed by addressing the vision. So let's talk about question number three. What can I do to help protect my eyes? Again, this is the most important thing that you wanna take away from today is like, what are you gonna do different after you listen to this uh, breakout session? So many of you uh, probably are wearing or using blue light glasses, right? Blue light glasses. I think some people on Amazon are making a kill in these days by selling all these blue light glasses. Some of them I would say are good. Some of them I would say I, I look at them and I don't see much in there. Um, but for blue light glasses, um, a way that you can check to see if your blue light glasses seem to be doing anything. First of all, when you hold them up to the screen, you should be able to notice that the coloration is slightly different. It does tend to put a little bit of a yellow tint onto the screen, and that's, that's part of what the glasses are supposed to do. Um, you can also see this, um, this lady here in this picture. She has kind of like a blue sheen on her glasses. Um, that's part of the anti-glare coating, but that is also helping to decrease or block some of that blue light. Um, and so those uh, can be very, very helpful. Patients ask me, they say, you know, doc, should I, should I wear blue light glasses? And I tell them, you know, if you were to go outside into the sun, would you put on sunglasses? Um, yes, you know, sure. Uh, it, it's an extra level of protection, right? So uh, if it's not cumbersome to you to wear blue light glasses, I think it's great. I think any level of protection is helpful. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're on screen time for more than about an hour a day, then yes, I would definitely more highly encourage wearing blue light glasses versus if you're on screen time, like very seldom, then I would say, okay, maybe it's not necessary. Your exposure is not that much. Uh, did you also know that there are settings that you can put on your computer screens and your iPads and your phones? So look for your display settings or look on your iPad. There is a blue light filter that you can switch on and it will dim your screen um, to make it uh, more easy on the eyes. So I definitely would recommend that's one easy thing that you can do already to cut down the amount of blue light um, exposure that you're getting. Okay, let's talk about computer and reading classes. Now this is different. This is different than blue light glasses um, in some senses because some blue light glasses have no uh, prescription in them. They just have that blue blocking protection. Um, but for computer and reading glasses, these actually do have pre prescription in them. Um, so we may prescribe this to kids and adults that are doing a lot of reading or a lot of schoolwork um, because it can help their eyes to be more relaxed or more focused um, when they are reading. Um, I also look for the symptoms. Sometimes patients say like, oh, when I look at the screen and then I look up after a while, like it takes a while for my eyes to adjust back to normal. Um, that could be an indication that I feel like they are overstraining or overusing the muscle within their eye um, to help them to focus for a prolonged period of time. And I would say, hey, you know, a light magnification that we would use on the computer screen, I think could be really helpful for you. I want to talk to you about this cool lens called the neuro lens. Um, this is uh, just cutting edge technology. Uh, we have it at our office. Uh, we're probably one of the uh, few locations in Orange County. Um, this is not something that you can get at every optometrist or, or every lens crafter's office. This is a very specialized um, therapeutic lens, right? So when I mean therapeutic, what I mean by that is it's not just prescription to see, there's actually an added technology that they're putting into these lenses to help decrease eye strain and headaches. So there is a machine that takes a measurement with the neural lens. You have to take what's called the sight sync machine. Um, and when you look at this machine, it's going to be measuring the posture of your eyes. So do you remember in the past, in question number two, there was a picture of that girl and she was like rubbing her head and taking her glasses off because she was getting a lot of eye strain because her eyes had to be postured inwards. Um, so if you take a look at this scan, what this scan is showing is um, the green line is where our eyes should be postured. And the red line is where our eyes really are postured, right? 
So the discrepancy between those two can cause a lot of eye strain, a lot of headaches, and can cause patients to feel very symptomatic, right? Um, if you take a look at this, this measurement over here, where it says at near, the ideal is the green, but the red is where you really are. It's about 2.75 exo. That means it's 2.75 prison diopters difference or discrepancy between where the eyes are postured versus where the eyes should be pointed when you're looking up close. So there are special lenses such as the neural lens that can actually help to correct for this. Um, in the technology, it's called contoured prism. And what it does is it helps to um, decrease or helps to correct for that gap um, between where the eyes are postured and where they should be postured. Um, and this is, it's crazy, but you know, like if you look onto the website, like people cry when they put on these lenses. It really gives them a lot of relief. Headache sufferers, migraine sufferers, this is definitely something that you wanna consider. Um, it can be very, very helpful in decreasing a lot of your symptoms. And who would have known that it was caused by a misalignment in the eyes? So that's definitely something that you wanna look into if that sounds like um, something that you may suffer from. All right, let's talk about myopia management. Um, so let me tell you a story about me. When I was in sixth grade, I started at a negative one prescription. Then next year, I went back to the eye doctor. The eye doctor gave me negative 1.5. Then next year, I went to the eye doctor. I went to negative two prescription. Then next year after that, I went to a 2.5 and on and on and on. Every year, I, my, I had to make my glasses stronger. That is very, very typical of nearsightedness. Nearsightedness does not stay put. Um, it tends to uh, increase. Right. So when we were talking about before, you know, huge, huge jump in nearsightedness in society, probably due to increased screen time. Now we want to look at what we can do as doctors, as prescribing doctors, to try to help combat um, this huge rise in nearsightedness and really to help protect the health of the kids, um, of, of the kids, children's eyes. Right. And so we joined this company. It's called Treehouse Eyes. Um, it's myopia care for kids. It's really a, a, a national organization, a, a collaboration of, of all doctors committed to doing myopia management or myopia care. And it's all about preventative treatment. So pretty much we're saying, look, um, this is your kid's nearsightedness now. Um, we can't erase prescription, but the best thing that we can do is to help try to slow down the rate of change so that it won't progress as fast. Um, some of the treatments they say are really about 70% effective in slowing down the rate of change or the rate of worsening of that nearsightedness. So definitely if you have kids that are nearsighted, if you have learners that are nearsighted, um, you definitely want to look into or to get them into a myopia management program. Um, we are doing them a disservice if all we do is update or make their glasses stronger every year um, without having a conversation with the parents about really uh, what we can be prescribing instead to be more protective for their eyes um, instead of just, uh, just using standard glasses. So. Um, definitely something that you want to keep in mind. Okay, next is eye exercises or vision therapy. So since we had just talked about in question number one, all the different demands that is putting on our eyes when we're doing virtual learning, if we feel like the like a learner's vision system is not able to keep up with it, we may need to do some exercises. Right, and exercises are all aimed to strengthen the muscles, strengthen the stamina, the flexibility, and the focus of the eyes. Right, so here in these pictures, you can see um, some um, exercises that we're doing. We work on eye hand coordination, we work on depth perception. This gentleman here in the middle, he's working on a convergence activity, and all of these games are really aimed at uh, strengthening the eyes and the visual system so that symptoms don't arise. Right, and so um, that can be very, very helpful um, because I think you know a lot of uh, these learners and their eyes and their vision system are really being taxed by a lot of um, all this you know screen time. All right, so I'm going to show you a video. This is called an eye stretch, okay, or or, or it is an eye stretch. We call it thumb rotations to be more specific. Um, it is a very quick activity that you can do before and after you jump on a virtual session. Um, and it's really, it's really easy. All you need is your thumb. I will go ahead and play the video. All right, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna just move your arm in a circle. And as you're moving your arm around in a circle, you're gonna be following your thumb with your eye. 
Did you know that you actually have six muscles around your eye that help to move your eye from side to side? Um, you probably don't even realize that your eyes are moving uh, because you just you just look there, right? Um, but these muscles are responsible for getting your eyes to move um, in the direction that you want them to. Um, and just like any muscle, they can be stretched, they can be moved, they can be strengthened, right? And so when you are doing this exercise, you do not want to do small little circles because your eye won't really feel the stretch. You want to have your thumb as high as you can, as far to the left as you can, as far down as you can, as far right as you can, until you can really feel the stretch right around your eyebrow area and like underneath below your cheek, your, the bony part of your eye, we call that the orbit, um, you can actually feel those muscles stretching. Um, and if you do five circles per eye before and after a virtual session, you will feel a big improvement um, in your eye flexibility. Let's talk about proper ergonomics. We've all seen this before. We all know what we're supposed to do and yet we don't always work or do virtual learning in this posture. But the best ergonomic posture, of course, is to have a chair with lumbar support that's supporting your lower back. Um, our, our shoulders should be in the back position, not hunched forward or rolled forward. Our neck should not be protruding forward. We should be sitting up as straight as we can. Um, viewing distance should be about 20 to 40 inches away, about arm's length. Our arm should be at a 45 degree angle and uh, the top of our monitor should be at eye level or slightly below with our feet flat on the floor. So this is the proper ergonomic structure or posture that we should be doing virtual learning in that probably could fix a lot of problems, but I know that we are all guilty of not always sitting this way. The next thing I wanna teach you is called the Harmon distance. So I want everybody to lift up your hand, put it in a fist, Put it right under your chin and reach out and tap the back of your elbow, right? At that distance, the back of your elbow, that is the proper distance in which to be holding a book when you're reading, your phone when you're looking at text messages, um, or an iPad if you're playing, right? Um, so though uh, that harm and distance is very, very important. You can teach all your learners that. Um, if you ever feel them creeping in too close to the page, just say, hey, stick out your elbow, you know, elbows distance away, um, and that's gonna be a more proper working distance. So the worst thing that we see as an optometrist is this. I cringe when I see this. We walk into a restaurant and you look over and in the next table you have a family with a little kid who's on mom and dad's cell phone and they're like this. And they're like six inches away from the screen. And I think, oh, that's so bad for your eyes, right? The working distance is too close. So you definitely want to respect or um, pay attention to the proper working distance when we're using any kind of screen. The last thing I want to teach you is the 20-20-20 rule. Now, you may have heard of optometrists say, oh, you know, you have 20-20 vision. So this is kind of a neat, catchy thing that optometrists came up with to help relax the eyes. We're going to do it right now, right? It's been more than 20 minutes, so we are overdue for our 20-20-20 break. For um, 20 seconds, we are going to look 20 feet away. So I'd like everybody to just look up from the screen. And you're either going to look down the hallway, look across your living room, look out the window, and you're just going to be resting your eyes. And we're just going to sit there and you're just going to do it for about 20 seconds. All right, and then you come back to the screen and you just gave your eyes a visual break. And that's all it took. You didn't have to like break concentration too much, but it's just giving your eyes a visual break so they're not staring at the screen for such a prolonged period of time. The last take home message that I wanna leave with you is outdoor playtime is the best medicine for your eyes. When you are outdoors, we call that optical affinity. If you look at the furthest mountain range that you can ever see, that's like infinitely far away, right? That is the most relaxed posture for your eyes. Um, also, when we are outdoors, we believe that everything is healthy, like body coordination, running, exercise, getting your blood, you know, pumping and moving, your heart is, is pumping, right? Um, all of those things are just so great for your body and also so great for your eyes. So I know that we are, you know, spending so much time indoors because we're doing virtual learning, but minimum two hours of outdoor time a day is really um, what we're requiring or what we're recommending um, as far as to combat all this indoor time and indoor screen time. 
So thank you. I mean, I really appreciate you coming to our breakout session um, and learning about your eyes. You know, very, very passionate about it. I think this would be just something to keep in mind, you know, when you're doing um, all your digital learning, when you guys are doing digital instruction and also for your learners, you know, and to keep them in mind um, and, uh, you know, to do so a lot of the recommendations that we talked about, simple things that you can change in your environment um, to just make it a little bit more safe for your eyes to be on screen. Oh, awesome. So Rebecca, hey, great job. She said she already adjusted her screen settings and she feels better already. So that's great. Um, Carrie, you said to everyone, you said, do blue light glasses help? Um, so blue light glasses, I, I think are somewhat helpful, um, but at, at the same time, it's uh, they don't block 100% of light. I've, I've heard that, um, but like I said, any level of protection I think is, is better. Um, you can, uh, if you have no prescription, you can buy non-prescription blue light glasses. But if you do have prescription lenses, you can pay to um, put the anti-glare coating on the lens that has blue light protection. Um, so I would definitely, if you have wear prescription lenses, I would just make sure that you put the blue light blocking anti-glare coating on. Um, so that would be uh, you know, very helpful. So if you have any other questions, throw them into the chat. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Other than that, if you have nothing else, then thank you for logging on. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Christine, you have here, what about adjusting the settings on your computer screen instead of wearing blue light glasses? Is that effective? Um, I would say that would be fine, Christine. Yeah, uh, I, I think if you're already doing, uh, changing the settings and you're already cutting it down, uh, I don't know actually the studies about wearing blue light glasses on top of changing the settings, but I, I would imagine that it would be even, even more protection. You know, but um, you know, changing the settings, I think, is a, is a great start and it's very easy, costs nothing, right? Uh, Jenny said, can you review how to change the settings to reduce blue light? Um, sorry, Jenny, I don't know how to walk you through that. I think it's computer specific. So you would probably have to go into your display settings, I think, you know, where you adjust your screensaver. I'm pretty sure that's how you would find it. I know that iPads and iPhones have a, a blue light function that you can click onto your phone if you go into the settings, the one that looks like the cogs and the wheels. Um, I, yeah, Google it. There you go. That's a good idea. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you for logging on. Really appreciate your attendance. Have a wonderful time at the symposium and um, I hope you learn a lot uh, during this, these sessions. Uh, Lisa said, would eye exercises help with myopic degeneration, uh, myopic generation and probably degeneration, right? Yeah. Um, and are you talking about just for normal kids? I guess the question, I could answer the question both ways. There actually is a condition called myopic degeneration. These are people that have nearsightedness at a huge amount. They have like negative 20 prescription. It's crazy. Uh, we have a few in our office, um, but uh, I think maybe you might be talking about just in general, kids that their nearsightedness is getting worse. Um, you know, eye exercises are helpful. We do do them at our office, but it has not really been proven to slow down nearsightedness. Um, with exercises alone. Um, so I have been asked that by parents and I say, you know, I think eye exercises can help a lot with the posture of the eyes, making sure the eyes are not overstraining, which maybe could, you know, trigger some nearsightedness. But to officially say that eye exercises will slow down the nearsighted, the change in nearsightedness, nothing that's been shown so far. Uh, Lisa, if it's okay if I share this, you said um, you have regular eye infections yourself, so you wonder if exercises would help injections. I'm not sure, Lisa, about that. Maybe, Lisa, if you want to email me, I'm not sure, or if you want to come onto the screen and ask the question in person, I could have a dialogue with you about that. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Hi there, can I just ask the question? Sorry, my um, I've got a, a few keys on my keyboard that lift off, and so, so oh, the, okay. wrong letters, the wrong letters were going. I was like, no, <laughs> like my J, for example, is right off. Um, it's just a quick question. I have um, myopic degeneration, and um, I have injections 
side. Would the eye exercises help at all with that? Okay. So um, this is where, are, are they doing injections of the eye to help with some swelling that you have inside your eye? Um, yeah, yeah, in the okay. past, yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately, no. no. Um, unfortunately, no, I, I <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I okay. wish I could give you some magic exercises that could help decrease the amount of injections you have to get, you know. Um, so yeah. actually, you know, Lisa, you you bring up a good point. Like, remember when we talked about nearsightedness increasing, right? Um, yeah. And it being caused by stretching of the eye. So you are kind of a, a, an example, if, if you're allowed me to use you as an example, where the mm -hmm. eye has gotten so long, right? You probably have a very high prescription, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so that has actually stretched or caused some tearing in a portion of your retina. Right. Yeah. And then that can cause some complications, which is why you have to get injections. Yeah. You know, yeah. so very, very um, I'm, I'm sorry that you have to go through this. I, I know it's not fun, um, but <laughs> definitely I would say if I don't know if you have children, you know, but yeah. something that you would want to consider for them because you having a very high nearsighted prescription, they do have a higher chance to get yeah. that as well. So at least we can do intervention for them so that yeah. in the long term, when they get older, hopefully their prescription won't be as high and yeah, they won't have right. complications. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've got my, my dad's actually got retinitis pigmentosa. So I always wonder if there's a, a link with any of it, although I'm told there's not, but yeah. <laughs> who knows, but it was just about the exercise. I just thought, Oh, well, that'd be great if I could improve something, but. Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be great. I would. All right. Though. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you very much. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you guys for logging on. Oh, I had a sneak preview in here. This is just for funsies. We just did a dance in our office. Nobody has to watch, but we just did it for fun. <laughs> we were like in COVID and we're like, let's just do a social media post and say, hey, you know, we're still we're still celebrating. There's still the silver lining and all of this. And one day this will all be passed. So that was a fun thing that we did. <laughs> this is my office and my team. They're great. So thank you guys for logging on. Really appreciate it and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Okay.